today, uh, well, let's see. Today we're going to talk about, uh, this is the second uh, lecture in the series of three. Just a recap from last week. Uh, we looked at briefly why businesses might be interested in biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and we looked a little bit at how um, companies can uh, understand their links to biodiversity and ecosystem services, measure the strength of those linkages, value those linkages using some of the, the economic valuation tools that you've, you've heard about, and report on those, those linkages and the, uh, their impacts, their dependence, and their responses to biodiversity loss. What I'd like to do today is talk a little bit more about what companies can do to reduce the damages that they cause, to avoid or mitigate risks, um, and also, on the plus side, what are the opportunities for businesses to uh, make money uh, or improve their, their performance by conserving biodiversity or supplying ecosystem services um, or restoring ecosystems, as the case may be. And this corresponds to chapters four and five of the, the Teeb for Business report. Now, this is not a new agenda. Um, this is a a famous cartoon uh, from 40 years ago, 1971, the first Earth Day. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Pogo. Pogo went out of production a long, long time ago. Walt Kelly is no longer with us. Um, but it, it has the famous line, we have met the enemy and he is us, which you must have heard of. And basically, I think this encapsulates a couple of things. Firstly, the value of nature the beauty of the forest primeval, as Porcupine says, um, and also the threat to that from our uh, consumer lifestyle, the waste and other pollutants and damages that result from uh, meeting human needs and human aspirations. And the question then is how do you, first of all, reduce that damage, but also find the business opportunity in reducing that damage? Um, there's an old saying, I think, uh, where there's muck, there's brass. Um, I don't know where that comes from, the UK probably, but the idea is that there's always a business opportunity, even in something that seems very unlikely, such as a mess in the forest. So let's first of all look at the, uh, the mitigation side. What can companies do to reduce damages? And there are many, many tools that have been developed over the last few years. I don't have time to go into all of them. Um, but broadly, I think you can categorize the different approaches to helping businesses, first of all, avoid negative impacts. Secondly, reducing those impacts or mitigating them. Um, and thirdly, verifying uh, how well they're doing this. And we talked a little bit last time about uh, the, the weaknesses of self-certification by business, that they often need outsiders, objective authorities to verify uh, what they're doing. Um, and just a few examples among the many that are out there and that are um, explained along with many other examples in the, the Teeb for Business report. Firstly, on the avoidance side, uh, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool is basically a geographic information system developed by Conservation International with a lot of uh, other business partners and uh, IUCN and, and UNEP, uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center, to basically provide companies with geographic information about where are biodiversity values high or at risk so that they can avoid those areas in their site selection processes. I and mean, that's sort of as, as far upstream as you can get, trying to avoid the footprint before it takes place um, and plan around that. Um, secondly, there are a whole range of tools available that businesses have developed themselves or have developed in partnership with others to try and reduce damages or mitigate impacts. Um, and I've highlighted one that um, I've been involved in uh, recently called the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program. Uh, which focuses on compensatory mitigations. So what do you do? You've, you've caused some damage. <clears throat> you've, you can't avoid it completely. What do you do about it? How do you measure your residual footprint and 
and compensate for that. And I'll come back to that. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, and as we also saw last week, there are a whole range of initiatives that allow companies to certify their performance and allow consumers, investors, um, and others to uh, discriminate when they're making their, their product purchasing or consumption choices. Now, I want to focus a little bit on biodiversity offsets, partly because I know a bit more about it, um, but also because I think it lies on the cusp between impact mitigation and business opportunity. Um, and I'll explain why in, in, in a few minutes. So what is BBOP? BBOP is a multi-stakeholder initiative. And many of these tools are the product of so-called multi-stakeholder initiatives. Governments, business, NGOs, community-based organizations getting together around uh, to try and find a solution to a, a problem. And this particular initiative um, is um, administered out of a US-based NGO called Forest Trends. Um, but it's really owned by all the partners in, in the program. And essentially what it tries to do is ensure that when businesses undertake to compensate for residual damage to biodiversity, they do it in a credible way, in a systematic way, um, and in a, a verifiable way. And they've developed a whole range of uh, documents and tools to, to do that. Now, where do offsets fit in the business response to environmental damage. People often refer to the, the mitigation hierarchy, or the environmental mitigation hierarchy as a sort of basic conceptual framework uh, for understanding um, how companies relate to biodiversity and ecosystems. And you can see on the left-hand side of, of the graph, there's an impact, whether it's from digging a mine, as in the case of Rio Tinto, they produced this, this graph, or um, building a parking lot or residential um, uh, development or a golf course or, what, or, or even a farm, there's an impact. It's usually negative relative to, to the baseline. Not always, but that's what we're mostly concerned about. And as I said, you can avoid some of that damage. You can minimize that damage. You can even rehabilitate after the project is complete, after the construction is done, after the mine is closed. You can try to restore native vegetation um, and create habitat that is conducive to the species that were there before, or perhaps even species that weren't there before but um, uh, could thrive in, in that location. But even after all those steps, there's usually a residual. There's a certain um, um, quantum of damage that you can't get rid of. And that's where the biodiversity offsets come in. It's an attempt to try to say, OK, we know there's residual damage. We can never get back to where we were before. So we're going to take, undertake some other actions that would provide some compensation that would replace the goods and services, the ecosystem services that were lost as a result of this residual impact. And then on top of the offset, there may be some other activities that uh, a company supports or that any organization supports in relation to that project, such as environmental education, where you can't trace the benefits directly in the same terms to a biodiversity outcome, but we know it makes a positive contribution. Institutional capacity building might be another example of an additional conservation action that would be supportive, um, but that is not as measurable as, as an offset attempts to be. So let's look a little bit more closely at, at offsets and at uh, Rio Tinto. Uh, this is a company that in 2004, under pressure from NGOs and, and others, and uh, thanks partly to the, the leadership of their, their senior executives, decided that they were going to try and have a positive impact on biodiversity, which is a very um, unusual thing for a mining company to promise, uh, given the, the nature of their business. But as it says, their aim is to ensure that biodiversity and conservation ultimately benefit from their presence in a region. So it's a very, it's a heroic ambition. It's an aspiration. And they would certainly not claim that they have achieved it or yet, but they're trying to take steps in that direction. Um, and a first step towards that was understanding what is their biodiversity profile, what is their footprint. And so they undertook a, a scoring uh, across all of their sites around the world to identify those sites that are, have relatively high biodiversity value, low or, or medium or very high. And they ranked them. And that was just a, a simple priority setting 
exercise based on various indicators, sort of conventional indicators of biodiversity value. Not so much economic as ecological. So looking again more closely at the, the offset component of the business response, uh, there's a definition um, that results from many years of work. You'd be surprised how much effort went into the few words on the screen. And that, again, is a reflection of this multi-stakeholder approach. It's typical that you have to get uh, a lot of people around a table for a long time um, wordsmithing to get agreement on, on a definition. Um, and this essentially says that biodiversity offsets are about compensating for significant residual adverse biodiversity impacts. And each of those words is meaningful. The significant uh, matters. You, why bother offsetting insignificant damages? Residual points to the fact that you only take, undertake an offset, offset after you've gone through the, whole, the rest of the mitigation um, hierarchy. You've avoided and minimized and rehabilitated as much as possible. And adverse, of course, recognizes that biodiversity impacts are not always negative, but we're mostly concerned with offsetting the negative ones. And I think the second sentence of, in the definition is also important because it makes it clear that it's what we are trying to offset. What are the impacts? Um, and it's not just in terms of ecological impact, species composition, habitat structure, but also ecosystem function and the use and cultural values that people obtain from biodiversity. So that adds to the ambition of an offset in that you're not simply trying to replace the ecological values, but also some of the economic values associated with those resources. And work is still ongoing to figure out how to do this in practice. Now, I realize that offsets are controversial in some quarters. Um, this is about carbon offsets, but I think the same um, concern applies in some people's mind to a biodiversity offset or a water quality offset. Um, and the cartoon, is, as you can see, is basically suggesting that um, uh, you can get a credit for not causing damage, that you, can get, you ought to get paid for inaction. And to be honest, this is what red is about too. It's the idea that you should be rewarded for not doing something. And that is, it's awfully difficult to determine whether somebody would have done something anyways and whether their inaction is really a positive contribution in some way. Um, and this dilemma affects uh, discussion about biodiversity offsets just as it does carbon offsets. Notwithstanding that concern, people are moving ahead quite quickly to develop methods and tools and techniques to deliver biodiversity offsets. And I, I want to um, distinguish here between three sort of broad categories. Uh, firstly, there's the, the one-off, case-by-case offset. You have a project, creates damage, you measure that impact, that footprint, and you compensate for it. And that's usually done um, on a like-for-like -like basis. You try to replace the ecosystem or the ecosystem services that were lost. Um, and it's often done as a, uh, on a kind of bi bilateral basis, a negotiation between the project developer, the cause of the impact, and local communities or local government. But then there are other uh, variations. There's biodiversity trading and biodiversity banking. And the idea of trading is simply that the offset is not necessarily provided by the person responsible for the damage, but it may be provided by a third party. Um, those transactions have to be verified. Um, and they have to be legal. So in France, for example, um, where they've been developing a biodiversity uh, offset and trading regime, they are constrained by French law, which does not allow you to transfer legal liability for damages. So the developer retains responsibility for the offset, even if they find a third party to carry out the compensation action. That's not the case in common law jurisdictions, so you have to look at the, the legal situation to understand what's feasible. Biodiversity banking is a, a, a third or, I suppose, a more uh, evolved version of, of this arrangement whereby you do the offsets in advance and you get credits in advance for providing ecosystem services, compensation benefits. Those are verified, again, by some credible agency, usually government, um, 
who issues credits to the entrepreneur who's undertaken this restoration. And then the entrepreneur needs to turn around and sell those credits to recoup their cost from a project developer. So this is, it's, spec it's environmental speculation in a sense. You go into a region where you think there's going to be some damage. You acquire land, you restore it, you get the government to give you credits for that restoration, and then you sell those credits later on to developers who may be coming into that area. And it can be quite profitable. Uh, wetland mitigation banking in the United States is an example of that, um, but there are other examples around the world. Okay. Um, why would people be interested in banking? Seems like an elaborate exercise to go through. Well, I think the, the basic argument is that you get better outcomes for biodiversity as a result. So if you just do case-by-case -case offsets, um, what you'll find is that the offsets are uh, developed and implemented in relation to the specific project, but not in relation to each other. And the net result after the development process is completed is you have a patchwork of offsets all over the landscape, which may or may not deliver um, the same kind of biodiversity outcome that you would get if you planned ahead. And so the idea of banking is you can use good land use planning, figure out where you want the mac to maximize your ecological benefits, where do you want your biodiversity, secure those assets first, and then allow development to take place uh, around that. And as we know from ecology, uh, connectivity and, and scale are very important features in providing biodiversity benefits. So the patchwork may not deliver what we need. Uh, and banking is one way to, to get around that problem. So what are we banking? What are these credits based on? Um, this is still not economics, but uh, there have been many people working for many years on trying to define these values um, and indicators to measure them. And within the, the Business and Biodiversity Offsets program, they've looked at intrinsic values, which most economists pr would argue don't exist, um, use values, and cultural values. And these are loosely based on the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, but not identical. And as I said, that first column, um, I suppose that's, from my perspective, <coughs> it's, a, it's a recognition of the fact that conservationists are particularly concerned about certain aspects of ecosystems and certain species. And they want to make sure that um, those values are retained, irrespective of whether they have any use value or non-use value or cultural value to human communities. And they look at different levels at species, habitats, and landscapes. Now, when you're doing uh, an offset calculation, you need to come up with a quantitative measure. And the, the usual way that uh, uh, the BBOP program tries to do this is to estimate what they call habitat volume. So they look at changes in habitat condition over time as a result of the project. And so if you look at the, the top in the, the, the red figure, um, you have a loss occurring quite soon after time zero. That's the project impact. In this case, it's a land clearing loss. And you need to not only look at the area, but also the quality of the uh, habitat that is lost as a result. Um, and then they look at the offsets. And there are two ways to look at this. One is to look at uh, improvements above the baseline. That's above the dotted line in the, on the left-hand side. But you can also look at avoided risk. And this is, again, similar to red, which you heard about I guess, uh, last week. If you can quantify the extent to which you are avoiding a measurable risk of biodiversity loss, then you can perhaps claim credit for that avoided risk. And again, you need to look at the quality changes in habitat associated with that. How do we look at the quality changes? Again, there's, there's a lot of work going into coming up with ecological indicators to measure changes in site condition, um, and also to account for um, the linkage between a particular site and the wider context. Um, and a few examples here. Uh, these are hypothetical, but uh, they've been used in the field in, in some places. The, the images on the right are actually from uh, South Africa. 
Um, so typically you start with a benchmark site. You want to understand what is the reference site, um, condition of biodiversity against which we are going to measure pluses and minuses. And in this case in South Africa, it was a large platinum mine. They found a relatively healthy um, ecosystem, fairly dry, so not a lot of vegetation, but that's the natural condition. And then they compared that to the site that was going to be mined, that's number two, which was degraded because there'd been a lot of livestock on there. And you need to take account of the difference between the reference or benchmark site and the project site, because you've already lost some quality that isn't necessarily attributable to the development project. Three is, well, what happens after the project? And that's the hole in the ground. I mean, that, that one is about three kilometers long by a kilometer deep. It's a big mess. And of course, there's not a lot of biodiversity in that hole. So you then need to measure the dif distance or, in, or the, the difference between two and three to get a, an estimate of the project impact. And then four is, um, again, a, a hypothetical estimate of what you would achieve afterwards through the restoration actions that you would take uh, on the offset site. Not in the mine. You're not doing this in that hole, but in an adjacent plot of land that provides similar services or better services. So essentially what you're trying to do is take something that looks like two, turn it into four, and measure the, the improvement against one. Um, and you're also taking account of the, the impacts in, in three. Sorry if that's not uh, immediately clear, but if you go to the Bebop site, you'll get uh, more guidance than you can possibly stand. Um, okay, lots of issues around offsets. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily the best thing since sliced bread, and there's a lot of controversy around it. Um, people often ask, you know, when is an offset appropriate? Are you allowed to negotiate between avoidance and other forms of mitigation and offsetting? And, and there's a strong view in the conservation community that you should only allow an offset at the very end of the mitigation hierarchy. Um, from an economic perspective, that's questionable because the avoidance has a cost, the mitigation has a cost, the offset has a cost and you need to trade off the costs and benefits of each of those stages. And there may be situations where you would accept um, a little bit less avoidance or a little bit less mitigation in favor of more offset because of the, what the, uh, the net benefits um, delivered will be. But as I say, that's a controversial point. Who wins and who loses is a major concern. If you offset um, on-site, even very close to the project site, it's not necessarily the same communities who are losing and gaining. So if ecosystem services are important here, and the offset site where you're trying to do the compensation is, say, five kilometers down the road, it's a different community that's benefiting from those services than the one that lost them. What's the currency? Another concern. Is like for like always better? Now I go back to the case of, of the platinum mine in South Africa. They were looking at compensating for loss of some dry land, um, range land, some scrub, um, nice stuff, but there's a lot of it, not particularly threatened in a South African context. Meanwhile, 10 kilometers down the road, there was a wetland under severe pressure, which might have been a higher priority from a conservation perspective. So should they have put the offset effort there instead of into restoring a, uh, an ecosystem that isn't so threatened. What are the limits of responsibility? Should the company be responsible for what happens uh, after the, the product has left their facility for uh, consumption or distribution impacts? Um, can we design an offset that would, uh, say, for uh, palm oil consumption that consumers might purchase? that would account for the impacts of palm oil production way upstream. And of course, there are a lot of issues around governance, security, um, land rights. I talked about the example of, of France, financing. Uh, very often, um, offsets will be set up with a um, insufficient funding. The developers say, well, we'll sponsor the creation of NGO, we'll set up a little trust fund to manage this area in perpetuity.
and people quickly discover that the trust fund is inadequate, the offset is starved of resources, and it fails. So this is a, a, a common problem. Also, as we've seen in the United States with wetland mitigation banking, enforcement matters. Um, you may get a, approval for your credit, but if nobody comes back five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road to ensure that you're still delivering those services, um, then you failed. And in many cases, government agencies themselves are underfunded and they don't have the resources to go around and check all these offsets year after year after year. But if you don't do that, then it's a temporary offset. So lots of issues and people working on trying to deal with these and um, the BBOP is probably uh, one of the more advanced efforts to try and deal with these and they've, um, they've come up with a set of principles for what is a good offset starting with the biodiversity impact, that it actually delivers no net loss of biodiversity, um, that the impacts are additional. You may have heard of this in the context of carbon offsets as well. It can't be business as usual, but you have to be able to show that this wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, adherence to the mitigation hierarchy. This is what I referred to, the idea that uh, you only do the offset at the very end of the, uh, the response to impact. Limits to what can be offset, very important, again, to many of the conservation NGOs involved in this. Um, and quite rightly, they feel that certain things are not offsettable. You don't replace, you know, extinction is forever, as they say. So you don't replace uh, a species that you've made extinct. And you also don't replace or compensate for a significant loss in the range of a highly threatened species. So they're, there's certain irreversible um, uh, impacts that should not be offset um, sh and should not occur in the first place. Landscape context is what I mentioned earlier about taking account of where offsets sit in, in the wider landscape and what's going on in the landscape because ecosystems are not static and lots of other things are happening besides the project. Participation and social equity, as you would expect with any multi-stakeholder initiative, is, is essential, and that includes uh, business participation. Um, just as an aside, uh, the people running the BBOP program have recently started working with governments about setting up policies and laws on offsets, um, and business uh, members of the BBOP network are uh, concerned, to say the least, about how that's going ahead and what's their role in um, a regulatory reform. Long-term outcomes refers to this issue about uh, enforcement and, and perpetuity. Transparency is a sort of a motherhood and apple pie. We all look for that. Science and traditional knowledge is an interesting one. It's the idea that you not only look at what the um, mainstream academic scientists are telling you about biodiversity and its value, but you also take account of indigenous and community concerns. And in some uh, situations, those may not be coincident. And so you need some way to factor in indigenous preferences and, and values, uh, sacred sites being a, an obvious example. Maybe that's not offsettable. Okay, let's come back to economics. That's a little bit of an aside on biodiversity offsets, what's the current state of thinking and what's one of the major initiatives trying to do. Um, but if we're looking at this from an economic perspective, as we do in TEAB, we need to translate all those ecological indicators of biodiversity and ecosystem services back into economic values. And of course, so we're starting as usual with the biophysical and then using various valuation methods to get to uh, monetary values. Not always necessary, but it's a, a major part of what TEAB is about. And I'd like to talk a little bit about a case study in uh, Madagascar, uh, again Rio Tinto, and apologies for all the Rio Tinto stuff, but that's what I've been working on recently. Um, this is an ilamite mine, which um, ilamite is a, an ore that's used to produce titanium dioxide, goes into paints, white paint in particular you can't have without titanium dioxide and various other industrial uh, products. Um, they have found a huge reserve of it in Madagascar. They have permission to mine that. Um, in uh, conjunction with their policy of trying to achieve a net positive impact on biodiversity, they've undertaken some biodiversity assessments and some conservation actions, including support for um, the creation of a protected area, 
in a forest, one of the largest remaining tropical forests in Madagascar, um, that's a, near their mine site. And originally they were thinking that they would use this um, as part of their offset, as part of their effort to achieve net positive impact. In the end, they didn't need it. They found other sites that were better, that were more like the impact sites, uh, and they used those instead. I think they ended up using about 1,000 hectares of this 60,000 as part of the overall package. But broadly, it was, uh, it was considered as an option. And once they'd started, they didn't want to back out. They wanted to follow through with the conservation investment. Yes? Uh, when you say like the impact site, do you mean in terms of the species that are at the impact site, or do you mean in terms of the marginal damage, or like the damages that will be done? Because the latter category potentially has a lot more flexibility. If you pick a site that has, that would be impacted in a monetary way, in a similar way, yes. then you potentially have more flexibility in saying, okay, we need a site that has about the same type of about the same speed. So it, it was more the former, because at that stage they were not looking at economic values. They were trying to follow the more strict um, biophysical definition of an offset. So they were looking for similar soil, similar vegetation, similar elevation, similar structure. Um, and, uh, you know, coming back to what I said earlier, that's when conservationists talk about offsets, those who are willing to talk about offsets, and many are not, they want to talk about ecological like-for-like, like, not economic like-for-like. Like. But uh, it's an interesting point, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Um, so while I was at IUCN, a colleague of mine and I uh, and some others worked with Rio Tinto to try and understand what were the costs and benefits of this conservation action. And the pretext for that it was, it was interesting. The, the company felt that by conserving this forest, they would have more than enough to offset. And they were right. And they thought, OK, could we get credit for that? If there was an offset trading scheme in Madagascar, how much would those credits be worth? And it was kind of a, an intellectual exercise for the company. They didn't think they were actually going to be able to sell credits. But they wanted to get to grips with the, the way these systems work in uh, a major project that they had. And so they wanted to understand what would be the value of the biodiversity benefits generated from this action in economic terms. And if there's really two ways to look at that. You can come at it from a cost side and say, what does it cost you to produce a credit? And, or you can come at it from the benefit side. What are the, what's the willingness to pay? What are the, the values generated by that, that action? And we did both of them in this case. So what we did in um, broad terms was try to estimate the value of expected changes in ecosystem services in business as usual, sort of continued um, degradation of this forest, versus a conservation scenario that uh, made certain assumptions about what would be achieved by the, the company's support and by government action to designate a protected area. And we looked at existence values, we looked at conser uh, soil conservation values, impacts downstream on agriculture, water supply and the role of forests in that, recognizing that that's a little controversial, carbon storage. We also looked at bioprospecting and ecotourism, but in the end we weren't uh, uh, convinced enough by the numbers that were coming out to, to include them in the analysis, but we didn't need that, as you'll see. And of course we looked, as I said, at the cost side. What does it cost to set up, but also to manage a protected area? And importantly, what are the, the benefits foregone to the local communities or others from not using this forest as they have been using it historically as an agricultural reserve, as a source of non-timber forest products, as a source of timber? Um, and I want to focus on some of the estimates and the uh, methods that we use to come up with these. And for those who uh, may have downloaded the slides before this lecture, apologies, I've added to them, um, partly with Pavan's encouragement that you like the detail. So I'm going to give you some of the detail. So let's look at existence values first at all. And I should preface that this case, like the one I presented last week, used benefits transfer. We did not go out to Madagascar and undertake um, original surveys 
Um, and in particular, if you're looking at existence values, global existence values, you'd need to do surveys of everybody in the world or a representative sample of everybody in the world, and we didn't have the time or the funding to do that. I think you can get a long way with benefits transfer. You don't get all the way, but you can get a good uh, first indication, um, and that may be enough to stimulate more action, more investment by the company in generating better data. And we've seen that in other cases, like the wholesome example I presented last uh, week. If you can provide some initial preliminary estimates, then the company may be prepared to put more resources into further research and refining those estimates. So what we did on existence values, well, we started with a previous study in Madagascar by the World Bank, Kramer and Mercer. It's Randy Kramer, now at Duke. Um, looking at the willingness to pay of US residents for the conservation of an additional 5% of the world's tropical forest. So they tried to look at a marginal change. And you'll know from your valuation lectures that you don't try to value the whole thing. You value an incremental change, a marginal change, um, because that is going to be more reliable than trying to value everything. Um, they obviously looked at the number of households in the United States, having carried out their survey. Um, and they envisaged in this uh, survey, uh, actually that was a, a follow-up paper, envisaged setting up a fund based on that willingness to pay. So typically in a, in a contingent valuation exercise, as you will know, you need a payment vehicle. You need a, a way that um, respondents can understand that if they did pay, where would that money go? And in this case, that was the idea of setting up a conservation fund. Um, and there were certain assumptions about the interest that would be generated by that fund, the income, um, a range of estimates using the usual sensitivity analyses. Um, you divide through by the area of tropical forests. You take 5% of that. Um, you look at the income from the fund, and you come up with an estimate of US dollars per hectare per year, 1997 values. Between about 2.6 and 3.9 US dollars per hectare per year. That's for US residents. So what uh, uh, David Pierce and his co-author did was then extrapolate to the rest of the OECD. It's a very simple back of the envelope calculation. Um, and came up with an estimate of between just about 17 and 25 US dollars per hectare per year as the existence value to households in OECD, relatively rich countries, from knowing that there would be a 5% increase in the area of tropical forests conserved. Um, fairly modest. You then just need to adjust that for inflation, and you come up with the estimate that we used in this case. Lots of assumptions here, and all of them are questionable. But again, it's, a, it's an attempt to try and get a first preliminary indication of what's the order of magnitude of this non-use value, this existence value that people talk about, but very rarely measure. And we compared this to other estimates, both for Madagascar and for other countries. And it seems to be in the right ballpark. So we were willing to go ahead with the lower bound estimate. That might be. Um, more speculative. Something that hopefully is a little bit more grounded, no pun intended, is erosion control. Um, looking at what happens when you remove forest cover to rates of erosion, sedimentation, runoff, um, and in particular, the impacts of that on agriculture downstream. Um, and we had uh, a range of estimates from um, Madagascar of the area of rice paddies that could be affected by deforestation around this forest. Uh, we had estimates from previous studies of the impacts of siltation on rice yields and rice production, and again, in US dollars per hectare per year. Um, and we had our own assumptions about how quickly this damage would take place. We assumed, as a, an earlier slide showed, 1 to 2% deforestation per year, which is fairly modest, but historically um, um, supported uh, rate. And we assume then that for every 1% of the forest that is lost, there's going to be uh, this downstream damage 
um, at valued at $44 per hectare per year of forest, that is to say. So you lose a hectare of forest, downstream impact was estimated at, at $44 per, per hectare. Um, do a little bit of math across those different areas of rice paddies and you come up with an estimate of the impact. Not huge, but worth considering. Then we looked at carbon. Um, much easier because we've got pretty good data on the carbon content of forests in Madagascar. Um, we have uh, good, con uh, good data on the content of the carbon content of secondary forest, that is to say of agricultural land, and we can look at the difference between intact forest and agricultural land. We have a lot of estimates of the value of carbon, ranging from uh, the price for red credits up to the social cost of carbon. Did you cover the social cost of carbon previously? Some of you are nodding your heads. Um, again, a simple multiplication. I should apologize for the number on the bottom. It uh, should say uh, 1.745, not 1,745. Um, so it's 1.745 million uh, estimate of the value of avoided CO2 equivalent based on a 1% deforestation rate and valued at the low end of the, the price range for carbon. As I said, we looked at the cost side and we looked at what are the benefits of slash and burn or shifting cultivation, which is known as TAVI in Madagascar. What are the benefits uh, that households derive from non-timber forest products and what are the net values of logging? in that country. And all of these uh, data come from existing studies in, in the country or even better from in the region. We tried to get as, as close as we could to the, the project site. And similarly, we had data from Madagascar on the cost of establishing and running a protected area. You can put all that together, and I'm not going to go through this table in detail, uh, time's moving on, but um, just to mention that uh, we had to convert the carbon value and into an annualized flow because when you look at the, the change, it's a, it's, a, it's a stock change and we need to convert that so it's comparable with these other flow variables. Um, and I mentioned that ecotourism, we had some data but it was uh, not on a per hectare basis and we also uh, concluded that any increase or, or change in ecotourism at that forest site, which is not a major um, tourism uh, destination, would simply cannibalize visits to other sites in, in Madagascar, so there would be no net gain there. And bioprospecting, this is the, the idea that there are cures for cancer or other um, values in, in, uh, in the forest, in, in wild species, or in their genetic material. The problem there is the range of values is so vast that we, we couldn't reliably use it to, to say much at all. And that is unfortunately an area where we need much better research than, than we have. Put it together and you get an estimate of net present value of conserving this particular piece of forest. A um, little over 17 million US dollars in uh, net present value terms. And if you look at the chart, you can see that the biggest benefit by far is carbon. And this is in contrast to what we saw in the case study last week in, in uh, the UK. Again, we're looking at mature tropical forest here rather than uh, wetlands in, uh, in the UK. Um, and you also see that the biodiversity values are by comparison relatively low. And again, that's because you're spreading the willingness to pay of households in the OECD for uh, global forest conservation across all tropical rainforests everywhere. Uh, water supply and soil conservation benefits are surprisingly small, and that may be the fact that um, this is a sparsely populated area, and unfortunately, the value of agricultural production in this area is extremely low. These are very, very poor people. Um, and so there's an ethical issue here you might have significant impacts on local agricultural production and, and local nutrition, but because that is valued at such a small amount, it doesn't, it doesn't appear significant when you compare it to some of these other global values, such as OECD willingness to pay for existence or the, the global market's willingness to pay for, for carbon. 
Um, on the other side, the, the biggest cost item uh, is the opportunity cost, and that is the same as we saw in, in the, the wetland case from the UK. And I'll come back to uh, a, an obvious implication of this, which you might have already thought of. To do that, though, I want to go briefly through some of the, the positive sides. So what I've talked about now is avoidance, mitigation, and offsets as an example of a mitigation strategy. Um, I, I alluded briefly to the idea that offsets might be tradable, they might generate value, and that uh, you can set up uh, businesses to do this. Um, I want to quickly go through some of the other opportunities that are there. Um, there are many, and um, this is one report among several in the last few years that have tried to identify how do you create business value from conserving biodiversity or providing ecosystem services, whether that's adding biodiversity to an existing business line or establishing entirely new markets. And so on the bottom right, you've got the examples of um, biocarbon and Red Plus or water quality trading, biodiversity banking, which I've referred to, where you're not just adding biodiversity to something that an existing product or service, but creating an entirely new sector. Adding biodiversity to an existing product is obviously easier. You've got established uh, marketing and, and uh, um, communication systems and, and governance arrangements, and probably the best known, you'll be know more about this than I will, since this is a forestry school, um, is forest certification. Right? Something like uh, a quarter of all global supply of industrial roundwood is now certified under one of these, these various schemes. We've seen consolidation in the different schemes. So whereas 10 years ago, we had many disparate certification schemes all competing with each other. Now we're basically just have two. And uh, Forest Stewardship Council is the, the leading one of those. Um, but we also have a problem in that forest certification was basically set up to deal with deforestation in the tropics. But that is not where it has taken hold. So most of the forest certified are in temperate regions. They're in Europe and in North America. Those forests are important, and it's good that they're certified, but this isn't where the, the problem really lies. Um, other issues to do with certification and labeling, uh, is the perennial one of regulatory capture. How do you ensure that um, the standards are uh, meaningful and that they are not necessarily just designed to suit the needs of industry? This has been an issue in the, the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program, too. You want business participation, but you don't want business dominance. Um, how do you get wider and faster uptake uh, in a voluntary scheme if people don't have to buy uh, certified, um, if producers don't have to undergo certification? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you get wider uptake? And I think there are good lessons to be learned from the FSC and, and other forest certification schemes on that. It takes a lot of effort working particularly with retailers to try and to get commitments, a so-called buyer's club, for example. Um, and this is the, the strategy um, adopted by my new employer, WWF, which is to focus on those, those bottlenecks in commodity supply trains where you get a concentration of market power. And if you can get them to change their practices, that spreads right through the rest of the, of the market. Um, for similar reasons, people focus on Walmart, huge buyer. If you change their buying practices, you influence thousands, if not millions, of suppliers that feed their, their system. Uh, another issue, a perennial issue with all certification schemes, is, is the cost to small-scale producers. Um, and also the cost of meeting the standard if consumers don't want to pay. So who pays for the higher standard of a certification scheme? Ideally the consumer, but not always possible. Consumers claim they will buy green, but only if it doesn't cost them anymore in many cases. And that creates a problem because you're just passing the cost back upstream, up the supply chain to the producer, and if those producers are, for example, small-scale coffee producers or, uh, in uh, Latin America, you're imposing an additional burden on them and that they may not be able to recoup through a, a price premium. Uh, a lot of governments have tried to deal with that through uh, aid programs, but that's very often not a long-term sustainable solution, which is why many people look for regulated 
um, approaches, but uh, that's for the next lecture. S okay, I've talked a little bit about adding biodiversity to existing products and services. Another approach is to take those same negative impacts and try to turn them into positives. So try to find a market opportunity related to the adverse impact. And this is uh, from a colleague in Shell uh, who's responsible for their global environmental footprint uh, and trying to think about what are the impacts of Shell oil, and this would apply to any oil company and many other companies as well, and how can they turn that into a positive? So you start with CO2 emissions, and we know that you can turn that into a business opportunity through um, offsets, and you can get a biodiversity benefit through bio biocarbon offsets or through red schemes. Turns out that Shell, like a lot of these big companies, manages a lot of land. And so conceivably, they can actually generate carbon credits, biocarbon credits, or red credits from the way that they manage their land assets. Habitat disturbance, um, similarly, we talked about offsets, conservation banking, and trading schemes. Here again, Shell um, holds a lot of land, and in some countries, um, the regulatory environment uh, would allow them to get credit for improved environmental management on that land. And uh, I spent some time with them in Colorado looking at uh, some land that they had leased for uh, natural gas production, and it turned out to be the habitat of the, I think it's the black, white-footed ferret or black-footed ferret. I can't remember exactly which one. It's a critically endangered species. It's on the endangered species list. And they were wondering, well, could they get some credit by undertaking actions to improve the habitat condition for this ferret and also for some, some birds uh, that were on the verge of being listed. Water use, you can look at payments for watershed protection as a cost-effective means to... Uh, uh, secure water supplies. Marine footprint is more complicated, um, often because of the, um, the, the legal regime or lack of it. But there are some interesting examples looking at how you manage oil offshore oil rigs to get biodiversity benefits. And there's a, an example from another oil company in Yemen that is uh, finding that the protection area they put around their offshore rig has created a no-fish zone. And so you get more fish, and you also start getting other species colonizing those rigs. Um, a similar example, coming back to Shell, they have uh, major rigs in the North Sea, and there are questions about what to do with them when they've exhausted the petroleum reserves. Now, some people would say you should slice them off at the base, drag them back to shore, cut them into little pieces, and somehow make them go away or recycle them. That turns out to cost a fortune billions of dollars. So people are considering, are there other things that you could do with a defunct oil rig that would generate biodiversity benefit? So for example, if you topple it over, um, it provides habitat for fish, but it's also no good for fishing because your nets will get snared on the, the, all the junk in the rig. Corals will colonize it, so there might actually be a benefit from leaving the rig in place. Now, very controversial, uh, there's a lot of pollutants associated with those rigs as well. I'm not saying that's the answer, but I'm saying people are looking at um, sort of cost-effective ways to uh, generate biodiversity value from um, oil and gas production and, uh, and other old infrastructure. Pollution and waste, of course, we've got recycling and various tradable permit schemes and so on. Um, I realize I'm probably starting to sound like an apologist for the oil industry or the mining industry, and that's not my intention, but just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that people are thinking about in business and in some NGOs that work with business. I'm not sure how readable this is, but in TEAB we tried to come up with some rough estimates of how, what are these different markets, how big are they now, how big could they become over the next uh, 20 or, or uh, 40 years. Um, and this comes from Forest Trends, which keeps, and the Ecosystem Marketplace, um, which you may have seen, it's an interesting website. They keep tabs on these different markets and try to, uh, to get a sense of what, what's going on in them and how quickly they're developing. Uh, you can see from this that certified agricultural products um, are currently the biggest and are expected to remain the biggest 
area, and I think that's maybe a testament to the success of those labeling and certification schemes. But you can also see um, projections of rapid growth in some other areas. Um, just to, to highlight here, for example, uh, biocarbon in red. Um, this actually could be well above $10 billion a year, but uh, those were the projections at the time. Um, and certified forest products, again, expected to increase dramatically, even though it's already a big part of the, of the, the forest sector. Those are hypothetical guesses at best. Um, for a range of initiatives, which sometimes are called payments for ecosystem services, I'm sure you've heard about these and you probably are familiar. If you haven't memorized the, the classic definition of payment for ecosystem services uh, put out by Sven Wunder, a little over five years ago. A voluntary transaction, that's very important. Like any market transaction, has to be a willing buyer and a willing seller. Um, for a well-defined environmental service, again, very important. What exactly are you buying and selling? Or a land use likely to secure that service, which is a bit of a get-out clause. If you can't quantify the service itself, you try to um, define the type of uh, land management practices or marine ecosystem management practices that would generate the, the services that you're interested in. You need at least one buyer, at least one seller, and conditionality is critical. You don't get paid unless you provide the service. I mean, this is all sounds like any market, but um, from an environmental perspective, it was considered quite radical when the concept was, was put forward. What does it look like in practice? This is from Stefan Pagiola uh, at the World Bank. He's, uh, again, been a, a leading thinker in what are payments for ecosystem services and how to implement them. He's been doing it all over the world for several years. We have this standard problem. Conventional man management of a resource generates a certain level of benefit, but imposes external costs that the producer ignores. Um, more sustainable management of that same resource in the current market generates less value, and therefore it's not favored. Um, the payment for ecosystem service scheme simply says, well, if we pay a supplement on top of the conservation management, what, what is already earned by conservation management, we can get resource users to shift from the conventional to the conservation management regime. And there's this trade-off between how much or how little you need to pay. The minimum payment is the opportunity cost to the resource manager of making that shift from conventional to conservation management. Um, the maximum payment is the willingness to pay to avoid those damages. Uh, and that's where the negotiation and, and issues of market power come in, as to who's going to get uh, that, uh, that surplus. I'm not going to talk about the Catskills case, because you've already heard about it. Um, but just to mention that, although everybody talks about the Catskills, there are many, many other examples. Um, this is from France just near where I was living uh, and still living uh, for the next few weeks. Um, Evian is a brand you're probably familiar with. They discovered many years ago that there was a, a threat to their water supply. They didn't call it payment for ecosystem services. They just realized that if they wanted to protect the value of their asset and their license to bottle water, they needed to deal with the threat. The threat was agricultural runoff. And not surprisingly, they got in touch with the local uh, farmers' union and with local governments and came to a deal, and I don't know what price they ended up agreeing, um, but they came to a, a bilateral deal with the, the communities uh, in the upper watershed that supplies their resource. And uh, it's a complicated chart but because it, 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 it basically shows all the different parties that need to be involved in this, um, uh, this deal. But, Another example would be um, uh, Perrier Vitel, another well-known water brand. They, they've also done similar initiatives with farmers uh, in another part of France. And you can find examples in Costa Rica of a, a brewery that have, have done similar deals. So this is not just the Catskills, although people like to use that example because it's, it's relatively well documented. Okay, uh, one question that people often ask about payments for ecosystem services is what does this mean for poverty reduction, particularly in, in developing countries? Now, on the plus side, um, there might be new sources of income. You might be able to diversify your income 
and thereby reduce risk. So you're not just dependent on crop prices or commodity prices, but you have a, a separate source of income that is uncorrelated with those. Um, there might be opportunities to strengthen local institutions as people start organizing themselves around payment uh, schemes um, and learning how to manage resources in a way that delivers ecosystem services, contributes to human capital formation. That's all fine, but then on the downside, um, you can't sell what you don't own. And so if resource tenure is an issue, payments for ecosystem services might be difficult to set up, or those people who don't have legal title may not be able to participate. The setup costs can be quite substantial. Uh, we've seen that in many examples. Um, the capacity of governments to monitor and enforce contracts um, and ensure that uh, services are being delivered and that people are being paid for those services is not always there. Uh, corruption can be a major issue. Um, but I want to uh, highlight in particular the issue of um, reduced access to resources and reduced labor demand. And we've seen this even in the United States. There have been some interesting studies looking at the Conservation Reserve Program, which is managed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you pay farmers to take land out of production to deliver ecosystem benefits or conservation benefits, you only have to pay the farmer enough to make them better off. But remember, the farmer is looking at their net profits. So you don't have to pay for all the things that a farmer has to do to generate those net profits, right? Farmers buy seed, fertilizer, machinery, and all of those things are provided by other people in the local economy. So if you pay the farmer their net profits, they're happy, and you get your conservation benefit. But the seed supplier, the fertilizer supplier, the agricultural equipment supplier, and the person who maintains the tractors, they're out of a job. And we see that in other countries as well, that um, payments for ecosystem services can deliver income to resource owners, but they can also undermine the rest of the rural economy, which is predicated on certain production systems. So you need to think about how is the rest of the rural economy affected by these, these new initiatives. And I come back to the Madagascar case, where um, we have potentially a very large carbon benefit and potentially a significant opportunity cost, a loss of access to resources, loss of agricultural production. And the obvious uh, response to that, which you will have thought of already, is let's use the carbon value to compensate for the opportunity cost. And so one of the things that this company is looking at now is how to capture that carbon value through a RED project, how to set up uh, a scheme that would channel at least part of that revenue back to the local communities who are sacrificing their access to this forest um, for uh, uh, the sake of biodiversity. It can work because in this case the values in theory make that possible. Whether it will work in practice really depends, as I said, on a lot of institutional factors, um, the, the extent of corruption which in Madagascar is sometimes an issue, um, and whether the company really is going to keep to its word to, to make this happen. So that's what I had prepared for today. Um, I realize we've got about 10 minutes left, and I'm happy to go back to any slides or uh, take any comments or questions. I'll start there. 